Well, good afternoon. And welcome, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us to celebrate the appointment of Dr. Larry Kleinman as the Frederick C. Robbins, MD, Professor of Child and Adolescent Health. In view of the terrible events of yesterday, and in commemoration of all the school violence that we've seen over the last few years, I'd like you to spend 30 minutes quietly contemplating what's going on for children in this country, for children and adolescents, which I think is relevant to a professorship like this. But in the face of those tragedies, isn't it wonderful to have something like this to celebrate this afternoon? Professorships like the one we celebrate today honor our best and our brightest, and I am extremely proud of the work that our endowed professors do. They are terrific mentors, brilliant scientists, and excellent teachers, and they help us attract and keep the very best students. A practicing pediatrician and health services researcher, Dr. Kleinman is widely known for his work in measuring and improving the quality of health care, especially for children. Over the course of more than 20 years in the field, he's published landmark papers on the quality of pediatric care, he's developed innovative performance measures for the private sector, and collaboratively developed the first integrated conceptual framework for measuring the quality of the children's health care. Dr. Kleinman, we are delighted to be here this afternoon to celebrate your appointment and to recognize your outstanding work. Many congratulations. There are currently 112 endowed professors in the School of Medicine. 45 of those professorships were obtained during this uh, current campaign of forward thinking. This remarkable progress, I think, represents our university's excellence and our school's determination to recognize our superior faculty and the faith our generous donors have in us that this uh, wonderful trajectory will uh, endure. The endowed chair we celebrate today is named for one of the giants in the 175-year history of our school. Dr. Frederick Chapman Robbins. He was an absolute pioneer in the fields of pediatrics and virology. In 1954, he shared the Nobel Prize in Medicine with John Enders and Thomas Weller for his work growing poliovirus in culture, which led to the development of both the Sabin and Salk vaccines against polio. In 1966, Dr. Robbins was named Dean of the School of Medicine, a position that he filled with great distinction until 1980, when he became president of the Institute of Medicine, now called the National Academy of Medicine. Dr. Robbins conducted the pilot study into Rye syndrome during his tenure at the Institute of Medicine, which uncovered the dangers of prescribing aspirin to children with viral infections. In 1985, he returned to Case Western Reserve as a distinguished university professor and as dean emeritus. During this time, he helped to establish the school's collaboration with the government of Uganda and Makari University, which has been associated with a decrease in the incidence of HIV infections in Uganda. And th this coming year, we will celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Uganda connection with Case Western Reserve. He also helped launch Case's Center for Adolescent Health, which is now a part of our Prevention Research Center for Healthy Neighborhoods. In, in memory of his incredible legacy, the medical school's Frederick C. Robbins Society, the founding dean of whom is uh, here with us, Bob Haney, and the east wing of our medical school are named in Dr. Robbins' honor. And in May 2002, alumni and friends of the school donated funds to establish the professorship that we, that we celebrate today. The School of Medicine community is profoundly grateful for the vision and generosity of this committed group. 
And now it's my pleasure to move on with the program and introduce Dr. Michael Constant. Dr. Constant is Vice Dean for Translational Research and the Gertrude Lee Chandler Tucker Professor of Pediatrics at the School of Medicine and Vice Chair for Clinical Research at University Hospitals, Rainbow Babies, and Children's Hospital. An internationally renowned physician scientist specializing in cystic fibrosis, Dr. Constant's research has been funded by the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, the Food and Drug Administration, the National Institutes of Health, and numerous pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies focused on developing therapeutics for cystic fibrosis. He's published more than 150 peer-reviewed papers in leading medical journals, reporting basic and clinical research related to CF, as well as more than a dozen textbook chapters. He's a member of the American Pediatric Society, American Academy of Pediatrics, American Thoracic Society, and the Society for Pediatric Research. And in 2013, he was awarded the Case Western Reserve Medal for Excellence in Health Sciences Innovation, the School of Medicine's highest honor for research. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Constant. Well, thank you, Dean Davis, uh, for that introduction. And uh, Larry, on behalf of the Department of Pediatrics, uh, congratulations on your appointment uh, as a Frederick C. Robbins, MD, Professor of uh, Child and Adolescent Health. Um, yeah, during my tenure as chair of uh, the Department of Pediatrics, I was uh, presented with the opportunity to recruit um, a new director for the Center for Child Health and Policy at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. This opportunity arose uh, due to the uh, unfortunate death of uh, Dr. Leona Cutler, a very accomplished professor in the Department of Pediatrics, who established the center in 2007. And she served as his uh, director until her untimely death in November of 2013, uh, after nearly a year-long battle uh, uh, with cancer. So finding a suitable successor uh, for Dr. Cutler was no easy task. Uh, we, had, uh, we had big uh, shoes to fill, given the success of the center uh, under her leadership. A national search turned up uh, several very qualified candidates, uh, but it was clear from the first time that uh, I met Dr. Kleiman uh, that he would be the best choice to carry on the legacy that Dr. Cutler had established and the best choice to take the center to an even higher level of prominence. And the search committee came to that same conclusion. So during the recruitment process, uh, Dr. Kleiman was a tough negotiator. Uh, he knew what he needed uh, to take that Center for Child Health and Policy to the next level. And Larry knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, we finally snagged him, uh, and he joined the faculty in July of 2015, uh, but only after a major commitment uh, was made from the School of Medicine and from Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital uh, for his research program and the uh, advancement of the center. Dr. Kleiman brings uh, child health services research, child policy research, evaluation research, and child quality and safety research to our academic and our clinical communities. And it's in a way that can drive outstanding academic work and in a way that supports advocacy for equitable health system uh, and society. His experience as a clinician and educator and his accomplishments as a, a researcher and policy advocate uh, fit well with the mission of the center with Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital, as well as the School of Medicine. Dr. Kleiman presented a vision uh, that included the establishment of a Center for Adolescent Health and Policy uh, to be nested in the overall center. And this fit well given that our uh, teenagers in Cleveland and around the nation face many health challenges that are strongly tied to social determinants of health, including obesity, poor fitness, substance abuse, mental illness, teenage pregnancy, and as the dean pointed out from the unfortunate situation yesterday, uh, teen violence. And these are just to name a few. It is our hope that Dr. Kleiman will not only help the adolescents of our city throughout the work of the center, but that the center will become a national model for integrating clinical care, education, research, evaluation, policy, and advocacy for tackling adolescent health issues. Resources available to Dr. Kleiman uh, through the Robbins Professorship will help him achieve these goals. Dr. Kleiman possesses the skills and the wherewithal to make this and other initiatives happen. Uh, he has already established collaborations throughout the university to do so. Uh, 
including the establishment of an NIH-funded T32 training program uh, in primary care research that involves several key partners, including the Department of Family Medicine, the Schubert Center for Child Studies, the Prevention Research Center, and the Center on Urban Policies. He knows how to bring people together to work on a common goal. Since his arrival here, Dr. Kleiman has been very busy submitting uh, grants to support his own research and the research of the center, and has garnered more than $4 million in federal and state grants and contracts. So Larry, again, congratulations on being appointed to the Frederick C. Robbins, MD, Professor of Child and Adolescent Health. We know that uh, Dr. Robbins would be proud of you. It is now my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Charles Homer. Uh, Dr. Homer currently serves as the Senior Director for Policy and Evaluation for the Center for the Urban Child and Healthy Family at Boston Medical Center. And he's a Senior Fellow for Learning and Innovation at Economic Mobility Pathways, which is an anti-poverty organization in Boston. Dr. Homer is best known for serving as the CEO of the National Institute for Children's Health Quality, or NICHQ, an organization that he founded in 1999, and which is now a leading national organization that's focused on advancing uh, children's health and well-being. Other notable national service includes a stint at the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, where uh, from 2015 to 2016, Dr. Homer served as a Deputy Assistant Secretary for Human Services Policy in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation. Prior to joining uh, Boston Medical Center just a few months ago, we were fortunate to have Dr. Homer spend some time uh, this last fall with Dr. Kleiman and the faculty and the staff of the Center uh, for Child Health and Policy. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Homer to the podium. Well, thank you for that very kind introduction, and it's really an honor and pleasure to be here and to say a few remarks about uh, my good friend and longtime professional colleague, uh, Larry Kleinman. Uh, I think I'll be building on some of the themes uh, that you've heard about already about his remarkable career, maybe leavened a little by humor, humor in history. Um, but it is really a distinct honor for me to introduce him uh, specifically for his appointment as the Frederick C. Robbins Professor of Child and Adolescent Health. Uh, like Dr. Robbins, of course, Larry is a pediatrician. And also like Dr. Robbins, Larry spent part of his academic career at Boston Children's Hospital and here at Case Western. Dr. Robbins, when I read his biography, had a close connection to New York City, uh, where his father was, in fact, the director of the New York Botanical Garden. Larry also has a close connection to New York City. Of course, he was on the faculty there at Mount Sinai, but more important than that, he had the good pleasure and great wisdom of meeting his wife, Debbie, there, and where they spent their first several years of marriage together. Unlike Dr. Robbins, Larry has not yet been awarded the Nobel Prize for his work. Um, but having said that, his many creative new ideas have in fact been broadly recognized by his peers. There have been a number of his papers that have been most widely cited, a number of his presentations and abstracts uh, selected as the most notable abstracts at a variety of scientific meetings. Let's see if I can do... Uh, Larry did grow up in central uh, New Jersey, New Brunswick, Highland Park, which, uh, again, curiously enough, is about five miles away from where I grew up. I put a circle around that picture because I suspect many of you might not have been able to distinguish him from, from his colleagues in that image. Um, he was very close to his family. Uh, many of the stories that I heard in particular were about how he was motivated by his mother's political activism, and I think that's been a driving force for Larry in his, in his career. Uh, as many of us were in the era of the 70s, I would say he was sartorially challenged. Um, <laughs> But that has evolved with uh, time and professionalism. Unfortunately, this era has better clothes. Um, as anybody who knows Larry also knows, he attended Rutgers College and has a curious passion for the Scarlet Knights, uh, which is teaching him how to be humble and how to accept loss with grace. <laughs> 
he graduated, which many of you may not know, from college with a degree in history. Uh, that was his undergraduate major. And I think that likely explains why his first New England Journal of Medicine paper was entitled Lessons on the History of Diphtheria. Um, after his medical school and residency, he went into the National Health Service Corps, where he was the head of pediatric services at the Bridgeport Community Health Center, an experience that has long shaped his perspective on the importance of high quality care for children facing adversity and the role of physician as advocate. Another experience, uh, and this is again from his time at uh, in California, where Larry was a Robert Wood Johnson clinical scholar, and he worked closely with his mentor, uh, both at UCLA and at RAND, Bob Brook. For those of you who have had the pleasure of knowing Bob, Bob is really one of the greatest figures in American health services research, and certainly an iconoclast. Uh, Bob has been somewhere between frustrated and angry his whole career, I would say by the recognition that much of what we do, much of the services that we deliver to our patients in healthcare is not justified either by the evidence behind it nor even by expert opinion. And similarly, we fail to deliver services which are in fact uh, indicated. The first results in unnecessary harm and excess cost. The latter results in inequities in care in inadequate access to services which many need. Larry was in fact infect, infected by that same passion that Bob inspired and working closely with him published really a critical paper, certainly the first in pediatrics, that indicated that uh, the most common surgical procedure in childhood, the placing of uh, tympanostomy tubes was in fact quite frequently inappropriate. Uh, and based on that paper, um, I think few of us actually in the course of our careers have ever written papers that have had the impact that that paper has had on the practice of medicine, nor, few, nor many of us have had the experience of generating as much resistance uh, from one's paper, from one's professional colleagues. Larry has always been courageous, however, and speaking truth to power has been a characteristic of his uh, important and long productive career. In addition to that willingness to challenge uh, accepted norms, Larry thinks deeply and creatively, and often years ahead of the rest of us. Larry can see the horizon. He knows where the puck is often going to go. Um, I hope all of us are distracted by the presence <laughs> of a child. We are all, many of us pediatricians and child health folks. It would be foolish if we weren't. Um, but Larry did that in a number of areas. He and I had the good fortune of forming the first health services special interest group uh, within the ambulatory, now the Academic Pediatric Association. Larry largely formulated the conceptualization of why child health and children's health services are different from adult health services and why we need to structure our research and processes differently. And similarly, as you heard, was critical in establishing the whole framework for quality in the field of child health. One area that I was always struck with Larry's prescience about, and we spoke quite a bit about this, were the challenges in thinking about evidence-based medicine and using evidence uh, as the formation, as the basis for payment in, in medicine. Larry was deeply concerned about applying that threshold in pediatrics because he felt quite appropriately that it's harder to do research in child health. There are fewer uh, investments in research and child health. And so tying our payment only to those things that have evidence would particularly disadvantage those of us uh, who serve children. Uh, this concerns about an over-reliance in evidence-based medicine was both reflected by David Sackett later in his career, who's in fact the founder of evidence-based medicine, and was carefully analyzed by Sarah Rosenbaum, who's really the leading health uh, legal expert in America today, really confirming many of Larry's concerns. Concerns. When the federal government finally decided uh, it could do some investment in measuring how to develop better measures for quality of health care for children, Larry received one of only seven highly competitive national grants. All of the teams had great expertise. All of those teams have done excellent work and have produced high quality results. 
But I would say fairly, as a member of almost all of those research teams in one form or another, Larry's was far and away the most creative. Larry was willing to come up with new ideas and again challenge accepted norms. Just one of those ideas that I often think about is what's called the boundary guideline, which I think is one of the few measures that has the potential to not only meet the needs of regulators, which is what most quality measures use, but is actually something that clinicians are going to be able to embrace as it evolves and as it becomes more fully fleshed out. As you've heard, and I'll just be brief in my last comments, now that he's here in Cleveland, he is both keeping his attention on advancing this national dialogue and the national issues around measurement of quality and safety in children, and he is also focused intensively on improving outcomes for children and families in northeastern Ohio. This really builds on his passion for social justice that comes out of that work in Bridgeport, and he's helping to make sure that the hospital and health system are responding to the social needs of the community that were already met, mentioned, but he's doing so in a way that allow us to measure, in fact, are we doing it right? And and are we using the right methods so that the work that's done can actually better meet the needs of children? These are a few highlights of Larry's distinguished career. I just want to close with one additional comment, because underneath all of this remarkable intellectual achievement and little bit of humor along the way, uh, and his fondness, for, uh, <laughs> his fondness for both dogs and children, um, I do want to highlight something that I think those of us who know Larry well recognize that underneath all of this intellectual work is a true heart of gold. Larry cares deeply about ideas, but he cares more deeply about people. He cares about his family. He cares about the people he works with. He cares about his patients, and he cares about the community. Um, so can, with that, congratulations, Larry, on receiving this wonderful award, which is so well deserved. I would say I don't know what to say, <laughs> except that I was at the um, at my sister's graduation, my sister Marcia, who couldn't be here from college, when Senator Birch Bayh of Indiana followed a, a, a similarly generous introduction with uh, the phrase, my father would have appreciated those remarks. My mother would have believed them. So. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. That really is, uh, and, and everybody, Mike and, and Pam. Um, this was a very hard talk for me to write. Um, and it was hard because I was thinking about the present and the past and how they come together. So th that will be an important theme through this. Charlie has touched on a lot of the themes that uh, uh, that will be here as well, and that's what happens when the person who introduces you it introduces you um, you've known for thirty plus years and and known well um, and cared for and cared about. So I, I do want to acknowledge that I'm the second person to hold this chair, and Barbara Cromer was the Robbins professor. Um, in adolescent and child and adolescent health from 2002 to 2008. She's an adolescent medicine physician, family physician, um, who did critical work on uh, research on bone density and contraceptives in, in adolescent girls and women, uh, young women. So I, I just think it's important to recognize that um, uh, I'm trying to take this chair into places that it hasn't gone before, but it has been in very important places before. So as I started to do a little bit of research upon uh, about uh, Dr. Robbins, some before I got here, some after I was uh, here, um, I came across this photo, which is with Linus Pauling. It's in 1954 uh, in Sweden at the Nobel ceremony. Now, Linus Pauling was one of my personal hero heroes growing up because of how he blended political activism and scientific excellence. The other hero I would say I had, who I don't have a picture of, um, was Paul Robeson, who brought artistic excellence and political excellence uh, together. 
But I, I particularly like this quote, and I, I don't remember what award he was accepting, but one of the many awards in 1963 uh, that Dr. Chapman received said, we should abandon the people approach and take note of the total stream of life. Life is a dynamic continuum with the status at any one point in time being influenced by all that went before and in turn having effect upon all that follows. So I, I, that will largely be the theme of this talk, but it, it, moving from the personal to the global, that statement largely anticipates some of the most modern currents in child health and actually even in adult health that relate to the childhood origins of adult diseases and the notion of life course. And I think it, it's important. Hi, Hannah. Hi, sweetie. Um, it, it's important to recognize that uh, this was a man who saw the future as well as helped create the future. So, um, uh, and, and it, it's really quite humbling to, uh, to have his name associated uh, with me. So thinking about what went before, these are my parents at young ages, my dad as a soldier, my mom, I'm not quite sure um, when that was, but, uh, I'm sure they're here in many ways, but I wish they could be sitting here as well. Um, that's, that's the sadness of any achievement uh, as one moves through uh, different phases of one's life. Um, these are a couple of pictures of my dad, one with his mother, one with his mother and father. It's interesting that so many of the older pictures I have of him are as, in, in his uniform, but uh, he was proud. He was a master sergeant and uh, served with distinction. This is a picture of my mom with three of her sisters and one of her to-be brothers-in-law. Um, she was the seventh of nine children. And, uh, and being that I was the fifth of five for her, I am by a long shot the youngest of my generation. I have first cousins well into their 90s. So, um, so it's interesting and wonderful to have that opportunity to see life move forward. It's a picture of my parents in front of uh, one of the Washington monuments. And, uh, and this is in Glo at a restaurant in Gloucester, Massachusetts. One of the things I associate uh, with uh, much of my life are special places. And Gloucester is one of those special places for our family. Um, it's become a special place for Debbie and me. And, uh, and actually, Hannah, it was her first vacation was to, to Gloucester. So. Um, and this is Niagara Falls, which uh, my brother John and his wife uh, Barbara introduced to us through the, the Shaw Festival. Barbara grew up um, in, uh, in, in Buffalo and, and sadly is no longer with us. And I'll say a little more of her later. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, my in-laws, whom I never had the opportunity to know. So this is Debbie's parents, her brother Dave, David, who is here, and Debbie. Um, it's a photo of a photo, so it's a little bit off. But, but I just think it's important because uh, I wouldn't be here today if they hadn't uh, helped make Debbie the person whom she is. So um, the legacies are, are, uh, are broad. This is my sister Margaret and her husband Jerry. Margaret sadly passed away this year. Um, after a medical error. Um, and she was in the hospital in the first place because she had suffered a post-operative stroke that probably also was related to, to medical errors about a decade before. Um, so there's great sadness that she couldn't be here. Jerry, um, her husband, was a physician, a cardiologist. And when I went to medical school, I assumed I was going to be a cardiologist because I kind of liked mechanical things and I liked what, uh, what Jerry did. Uh, it, it was, uh, and I'm presaging a little bit, it was through some experiences, including working with Barbara and through Barbara at her children's hospital in Philadelphia at St. Christopher's, um, that I chose to become a pediatrician and came to, to understand. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. But Jerry, I did a fourth year uh, primary care rotation with. And he taught me how to understand the evidence and not necessarily believe it, but question it and be something of a heretic in clinical practice. Do you want, me, do you want to bring her up, Deb? It's fine. You can. <laughs> This is, this is about kids and family, if we need to. 
uh, if we need to bring her here. Um, yeah. uh, <laughs> Breaking the proceedings. All right, sweetheart. You can't touch the computer. <laughs> so, um, so there's mommy. Yeah. And, and so Jerry actually helped shape uh, the way I practiced. And among the things, he was a cardiologist who didn't believe in routine catheterization. So the notion of overuse actually first came to me and unnecessary use and inappropriateness working in his office. This is a picture of Barbara. Um, she's doing an ultrasound, but that ultrasound is actually on my niece, Molly, who's about to get her PhD. Honey, you need to stay away from the microphone on the computer. Uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, and Barbara was a tremendous influence in me professionally in two ways. One was um, her mother, who was a physician, had a very distinctive philosophy about learning medicine that she shared to Barbara and Barbara passed on to me. The, the, the short sum of it was that medical school was actually four years of learning vocabulary, and that one, when one left medical school, one went on to learn how to be a clinician. So, um, but, and I think that was actually very helpful. It's obviously uh, far too simplistic, but it's also profound. So that's Watson. Charlie showed him. And, and, um, and Watson was the joy of my life before Debbie. So, uh, and, and so th these are all personal reflections. I have a few more. That, those are uh, a couple of pictures of me from the 60s and 70s. So I did have hair once upon a time. That's the important message there. This is, is my brother, John. And I want you to see he's here. But I want you to see his picture because maybe you can find him with my mother in that picture uh, on the left at the March in Washington in 1963. Um, and Charlie mentioned the activism. Uh, I wasn't at that march, but I was at the one on April 15th, 1967 um, in New York City. I didn't make the march all the way. We cheated and took a bus part of the way. But uh, we marched with Dr. King. And uh, I was in num any number of marches in Washington with my mom and my mom and dad. Um, and so activism was an important part of who I am. <laughs> OK. So um, I, just wearing, noting some of the cultural attributes, in 1964, the uh, World's Fair, which went on 64 and 65, was uh, across the street from Shea Stadium in New York, where the Beatles concert took place. And so on that August day, um, my father, my sister, and Marcia and I drove into the parking lot at Shea Stadium, where the, um, uh, the, the, the attendant said, I'm sorry, no World's Fair parking today. Beatles concert, you know. My father said we were going to the concert. He asked to see the tickets, and I was in the back seat of the car, and I flashed them. And I'm telling you, until I got my MD, that was the proudest moment of my life. <laughs> so, uh, and I'm wearing, uh, I, I actually have a, a watch that was my father's on my wrist and on my feet today. I have um, socks, Beatles socks, that Marsha brought me back from a recent trip. So. Uh, uh, that's there. So I'm not going to go through this, but I want to point out that I've been a lot of places and done a lot of things. Uh, I've been on the dark side as a, as a, a for-profit entrepreneur. Uh, I've been on the light side as uh, doing what I'm doing now. And uh, I've done uh, many things in between. Uh, and it's always a journey. And I'm always learning and trying to move forward. And this is my cousin, Jesse, who is, is here. And uh, I, I highlighted one of the things from his career. Um, but Jesse was uh, director of diabetes grants at NIH and, um, and, a, and a leading researcher. He was acknowledged by his medical school as the, the most important alumnus of the first 25 classes and many other things. But what he was to me, by the way, he wasn't Jesse, he was Buddy. 
Yeah. And, and he was the one my mother pointed to once I said I wanted to have a career in medicine uh, to say you could do important yeah. things and you can succeed. Now, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give Hannah back to her mom. <laughs> Getting heavy, huh? Well, it was a partial experiment. Partially <laughs> successful experiment. Good girl, dear. And, um, you know, many families have mythical heroes who went to did great things, right? But it wasn't until many years later that I realized Jesse had actually done great things. So, and thank you for coming and Susan for being here today. So there are a number of themes. History. I've talked a little bit about history. I want to start to move a little more quickly. But this is a book on the history of neurology by Larry McHenry, who was a, my neurology preceptor in medical school. And we went on to do some research uh, on phrenology, which was something he really didn't know much about. But he said, pick anything in the book, and that's what I picked. And uh, I didn't particularly like medical school. It wasn't a good fit for me. And I wrote him a letter telling him what a, a beacon he had been for me during medical school. Um, and I wrote that during my internship. And I was very sad to get a note back that um, he had passed. They hadn't been able to reach me, and they read my letter as his, part of his eulogy. So it's more the, the, the bittersweet of coming in contact with important people in your lives. And it makes you vulnerable, and it makes you richer. So the, Charlie mentioned this article from the New England Journal, which actually came out of a Friday morning resident talk when I was uh, in, in second or third year of residency and you had to do a teaching lecture. And I tried to bring history together. I did a little thing on the history of diphtheria. And I, 15 years later, I picked it up. I was, uh, I was on the, the clinical faculty at Yale and had access to a great historical library. And it ended up being a very controversial um, paper because I said mandatory testing was not a bad thing. What you did with it determined whether it was good or bad. But the testing itself was not. I said quarantine was not a bad thing. And I say quarantine was not a bad thing because the definition of quarantine is isolating a causative agent from a population, not the person who carries the causative agent from the population. And actually, that part the New England Journal didn't let me put in because this was about safe sex campaigns as a form of quarantine. And um, that took it too far. But the mandatory testing um, conditional upon the being benefit and not harm they let me put it. So this is one theme, history. Another theme, advocacy and equity. So the first piece up here was something in Connecticut medicine that just was a, it was an experience about three children I saw on a particular week in the, in the, in the clinic in the National Health Service Corps. The other was a bit of a summary. We all thought that Clinton care was about to come in at that time and everybody was going to have health care services. So it wasn't going to be necessary to think about access. And this was, until Clinton Care comes, be an advocate. Be an advocate in your organization. Be an advocate in your professional societies. Be an advocate in how you frame and formulate questions. Be honest, but have your critical thinking geared towards what you can do and how you can make the world better, and that it's an obligation of the physician. Now, I wrote this when I was a first year clinical scholar, I'd been working on it since before I got there. And I had some help and I, I submitted it. And I got a phone call one day as a clinical scholar, as a fellow. And the person on the line was George Lundberg, editor in chief of JAMA. And he said, Larry, we'd like to accept your paper. We're creating a new column, caring for the uninsured and underinsured. We'd like it to be the first piece in it. And we're leading, doing four, having four of these and then leading up to a, a special issue on care of the underserved. And is it OK if we do it that way and don't put you in the special issue? I, I said I was honored and I'd be thrilled. And it was great. But I just thought it was normal to get calls from editors. What did I know? I'm still waiting for my next one from one of the from paper. So OK. So this was a piece, Homing in on the Homeless, Assessing the Physical Health of Homeless Adults. That's the part I want to get to. Um, that I did because Lillian Gelberg was a young family physician a few years ahead of me 
who was trying to establish herself. And as a woman and a family physician, she wasn't getting the respect she needed. And she had gotten a little bit of money to add on to a RAND study, and she needed some people who would do work for cheap. So for $1,000, which in those days bought me a dot matrix printer, um, that, it was full thousand dollars went right to that. She promised me it'd be six weeks of work. It was about three and a half years. <laughs> and, and we we put this paper together. Now Howard Freeman, I'll mention to you later, but he was he sadly was another of those important people in my life who passed away shortly thereafter. Um, this, this article, we couldn't get it published. It was neither a methods nor a results paper, and we really struggled to get it published. But we found an editor who was willing to work with us. And three times, this editor of the journal refined our paper and forced us to change it, and finally it was published. So that's great. It's published. It's barely been cited, sadly. But it was acknowledged by my peers as the best science in the field in that year it was published. It was one article of the year from what those days was Academy Health, uh, or those days was Association for Health Services Research and now Academy Health. So you never know. I mean, and I still hope. I, I, I send it to every mayor of New York when a new one is elected saying, this actually has stuff that could be helpful to you, but haven't gotten a response back. Um, this is a little, I, I don't expect to go through any of this, but other to, than to say, that part of the, the work we did in the Center of Excellence is we took seriously what the Institute of Medicine said in their definition of quality, that equity was one of six fundamental attributes. And we said, if we're going to start with that assumption, how does that impact how you report equity? And to my mind, or do you report quality? What, you, what it means is that when you report how well you're doing, you don't get one score for whites and one score for blacks. You get a score that combines how well you're doing with how equitably you're doing. And this is the thing that puts it together. And sadly, we haven't written this up into a journal article, uh, but I, I'm going to do that very shortly. It's a priority on my list of writings because uh, the data are getting old, and it's a really important construct. And it actually works for educational scores and other things. It's not limited to health. It's if you have inequitable performance, it's lower quality than if you get the same score and everybody does the same. I, I, I mean, Charlie and I have been having these conversations since 1994 at least, and maybe before that. So, um, OK, another theme, and I'm going to move quickly because I took a lot more on the, the family stuff than I intended, but that's, that's OK. Um, so the appropriateness of tympanostomy tubes uh, this is one where I had a conversation with Dr. Lundberg about another paper I called him this time. And he told me he had editors who worked for me, worked for him, not speak with him for six months, six, six months after publishing this paper. So it was really hard for him to publish another paper. He ultimately did. Um, one ENT, who I won't give the, the uh, notoriety of giving his name, in a book called this paper, A Delightful Example of Process Assessment Run Amok. Um, and uh, it said that scrutiny of the proprietary, proprietary criteria cited by Kleinman shows them to be biased. And in fact, they were biased. We found that about 30%, um, 25% uh, of tympanostomy tubes were inappropriate. But if we'd used the government criteria, it was 95%. And nobody would let me publish that. I never got, that never got published, well, sort of. It never got published with these data. It was the anger that this generated. There were 11 letters to the editor in JAMA about this. Keep in mind, this was in 1994 when the notion of scrutiny about what physicians do was an, a concept that generated anger. And I understand that. I, my propaganda, I hope all of you will try to avoid to ever use the term provider when talking about physicians. They are clinicians. We are clinicians. We are professionals. It's a part of an administrative deprofessionalization attempt. And that's how people saw this. Although this was really done with clinicians and patients in mind. But they didn't know that, and they didn't understand that. And viscerally, it didn't feel that way. So it got a lot of attention. And I, I don't have a pointer, I don't think. Um, can I? Sh oh, yeah. So I just want to point out some people were a little out of proportion. Child's ear surgery, not always needed, front top of the fold. 
voter, I've done my job. South Africa raises a new flag future. That was the story saying Nelson Mandela had cast his first vote, OK? A little bit off. Boston Globe got it a little better, but I, have, I did have a front page because I was a local story. I was in Boston when it was published. And the Wall Street Journal and New York Times got it better, sort of in the middle of where they talk about health. But it got a lot of attention. And the way I knew this paper was important was on the Saturday after it was published, my mother came home and said, you will not believe, or called me and said, you will not believe what people were talking about in the beauty parlor today. <laughs> Again, I thought that was normal. I was young enough to believe I could do this with every paper. Yeah, far from it. But when I went to Mount Sinai, Mark Chasson, who used to be at the place where I got the data, was the chair of my department. He's now the, the head of the, um, the Joint Commission. And Mark brought me in to be his vice chair and brought me into a project he was doing on tympanosome tubes. Oh, by the way, at the time, he said, don't do tubes. Nobody cares. Do tonsillectomy. But in any case, <laughs> um, he, he, uh, he was doing this. And so I, I got brought in. And I said to Salome, who was the, the principal investigator, an internist, I said, guess what? You don't have to only use the criteria you've got. There are federal criteria, and they'll actually be stronger. So you can see that 10 years later, or eight years later, 92% um, and 94%, depending on what age group, were inappropriate if you use the federal criteria. That's the data I couldn't get published in 1994, but from a different data set and you know new time. Um, but we had to get it published overseas. Wasn't going to get published in the United States Journal. So third theme, fixing odds ratios. Briefly, wonky. Odds ratios are a very easy metric to come off of the most common multivariable modeling that people use, something called logistic regression. And the problem with odds ratio is they're uninterpretable. They vary depending on how common the event is. And because you don't know how the different numbers interplay, you don't know really how far off you are. But often, it's really far. And I remembered, so during my fellowship, Bob Brook would always say his sort of thing was assuming Prevalence is low. Assuming prevalence is low. So I went to a talk at Academy Health, a guy named Ed Norton, Edward Norton. Um, very complex, largely over my head. But I went to talk to some other people who are waiting in line to talk to him afterwards. And I realized this was an unsolved problem. How could you use logistic regression to get a risk ratio or a rate ratio rather than an odds ratio, which are the, the actual intuitive measures you want? And I just sat down and I figured it out. I mean, I just, I was. Uh, uh, not doing a lot of academic work at that point. I was in a community hospital setting, and I just decided this was going to be my project at night, because I wanted to figure it out. I tried to recruit Edward Norton into the project. He was about to have his first child, so he wasn't interested. But then I figured it I went, Then I did figure it out, and I showed it to him. He said, oh, yeah. So we then began about a 10-year collaboration on this. And these are three of the papers that we put. But the answer is it can be done, and it should be done, and it's not ethical not to do it. Because odds ratios always inflate the value, the effect size. So OK, leave it there. Um, another theme, communication. My mom was a communications guru, quite literally. She was a consultant who helped professional people figure out language and ways to use language as strategy. So I always thought about these kinds of things. And as a, as a nobody in the National Service Corps, I got an idea, and I managed to get it published in Connecticut Medicine as an editorial, as a guest editorial, about the language we use matters. Not such a radical concept these days, but I had a specific idea. But years later, one of the people Howard Freeman introduced me to was a guy named John Heritage, who was a giant in the field of um, what's called ethnomethodology. He was a qualitative, like way to one side qualitative scientist. He didn't believe in using numbers. And I corrupted him. And we did a collaborative project where I learned how to use his ideas, and he used how to use how to do modeling. And this is the one that, that George Lundberg was reluctant to publish, but ultimately did in JAMA. 
Charlie mentioned the notion of uncertainty. This paper came out of a chance conversation in a committee I was on when somebody was doing a, uh, a section for the American Journal of Public, uh, Preventive Medicine and asked me to write about an agenda for pediatric prevention research. And I realized we didn't really know enough. Um, and so I created a conceptual idea of the uncertainty index, which is the proportion of care that has not been shown to be ineffective and that, we or, and that we lack evidence is effective. So this is where it might be reasonable to do things without evidence. This is where expert opinion and experimentation and other things are important to do. But you can't write it out if you don't do the work. And the less research you do, the bigger the uncertainty index. So for pediatrics, it's here. For internal medicine, maybe it's here, OK? So it, this is this is. Again, part of the advocacy and part of the things. And the CAPQAM, which was the center of excellence, we, we said that this is the spectrum of amount of light we had, strong, some, very limited or no, that the current state with, of evidence required it to be in that bright area. And our goal was to try to move it into the lighter yellow area. We weren't yet saying go into the evidence-free zones, but somewhere in between. OK. And so. The legislation that funded the center required a consensus. We said it should be a consensus around the process, not the measure. Because otherwise, if you had legitimate disagreement, you couldn't have measurement, which to me seems absurd. And then we had this notion of boundary guideline, which Charlie mentioned, which is the idea there's probably a range of things that's reasonable, that you don't always know which of those it is. But you can say, this is a bad idea to do. And it's a real bad idea not to do this. And in here, there's where physician judgment and the art of medicine lies. And I, I do think that will be much more important. This is um, the pictogram we use for the work at the Center for Child Health and Policy, at the UH Rainbow Center for Child Health and Policy. Um, and we have five priorities, population health, maternal child, family, and community health, high impact health care, which is safe, effective, high quality care, high impact health conditions we're doing now, mental health, uh, infant mortality, um, obesity, and I'm forgetting something, uh, uh, asthma. And social justice is at its core and overlaps all of those. Um, current priorities in terms of the work is understanding the relationships of healthcare, health, and social needs. The link study that Sarah Ronis is, uh, is running point on and multiple evaluation projects that the center are doing with, in collaboration with many clinicians and administrators with, uh, Oh, Christina was here before, um, uh, was all a part of it. Um, we're doing work on mental health in vulnerable populations. The availability of high-risk obstetrical care will be our next grant. Infant mortality, coordination of care, and data integration. Um, some mentors, my parents, Gertrude and Milt, Bob Brook at UCLA. I can't say how, he, how important he was for changing the way I think. Howard Freeman, who was my guru. Paul Cleary, who made Harvard a safe space for me when I was at Boston Children's. Arthur Ausfus, who taught me the ways of uh, Mount Sinai. His most telling comment was when he was at Columbia, he walked the hallways and they were littered with bodies with knives sticking out the back. And Mount Sinai felt like home. It was so different. The bodies were still there, but all the knives were coming out the front. <laughs> Um, and then all my students, my fellow students, colleagues, the research and administrative teams, the people who I'm really learning from every day. And, and that is, with, without uh, those people, this work would not be worthwhile and it wouldn't grow because it would be the ideas I come in with, not the ideas I leave with. And some of my colleagues uh, and mentees, colleagues with recent work and recent mentees, Charlie, um, uh, Liz Howell, who's an obstetrician at, at Mount Sinai and disparities and, and uh, expert on uh, maternal morbidities. Ayal Shemesh, a triple boarded psychiatrist and head of DBP um, at, uh, at Mount Sinai. My KL2 mentees here, Sarah and Sarah Ronis and Paul Bakaki, the T32 scholars, I've seen several of them, uh, Bridget and Hey Nim. 
uh, Carissa, who just had a baby, and Talia, who I know is having babysitting issues and may be here later. Um, and then all the folks who coordinate and execute the work, and, I, and, and Ann Nevar, who's the manager of the center, and who I believe did a, uh, was probably responsible for the fact that the center held together through various changes of leadership, um, in part because of the work she did, and in part because of the optimism she was able to convey to Patty and others um, at, at uh, Rainbow about the importance uh, of maintaining the center. Um, then there's family. I've got my sisters. This is um, Margaret, John, Toby, and Marcia, and my parents. I'm guessing that's Cheesequake Park, John. Do you have any idea? Prospect. Oh, that's Prospect Park. Okay, it's in Brooklyn. And um, it, I can't say enough about the family, and there's many family members who obviously I'm not naming here, but that's the foundation. In addition to the children and to the community and to the vulnerable families, the thing that's important in life is, is family. And so with that, a few family pictures. That's Debbie in, in Petra, and again, on a, at altitude in Petra. Uh, in the Indian Ocean, looking for right whales, southern right whales. Uh, that's in Gloucester. That's in Gloucester, too. That's Hannah's first birthday. That's in Dave's Market, Severance. That's in our kitchen. She's in charge. That's in Gloucester. And I'm going to leave with this quick video. 1,500 years ago, everybody knew the Earth was the center of the universe. 500 years ago, everybody knew the Earth was flat. And 15 minutes ago, you knew that people were alone on this planet. Imagine what you know tomorrow. And to me, that's the challenge. To keep the imagination open to know that we don't know it all today and to work to discover what we can for tomorrow. And I'll leave you with this picture, and if anyone wants to tell me later on what they see, um, it's, it may or not, may not be what's actually there. All right, thank you all very much, and I'm sorry that went quite so long. Thank you, Larry. Just stay up here just a moment longer. Our endowed professors represent the elite among scholars, educators, and clinicians. And certainly, you can see how Dr. Kleinman uh, is an exemplar in that, uh, in that group. Uh, Dr. Kleinman, it's a pleasure to recognize you as the uh, Frederick C. Robbins Professor of Child and Adolescent Health. And you may have a seat in your chair. Thank you. <laughs>